we're good? I think we are. All right. So um, my name is uh, Sven Eric Spiesiger. I'm the managing entomologist for the pest program at the Washington State Department of Agriculture. And normally I choose my topic uh, when I'm speaking somewhere, but actually I was so busy with an invasive eradication that I said, put down whatever. And what I drew was templates for eradication, Mediterranean snail, which I changed to vineyard snail because that's what we call it, and gypsy moth. And I am more than happy to do that. Um, mostly because I've been talking about hornets nonstop probably for the last three or four months. And Sven, I'm not sure what happened. I can't hear you. No. You're not it muted. Doing so good. Oh, Carla said to turn off your VPN if you have it on that that might help. Nope, still nothing. Sven, look in the audio section of the GoToWebinar control panel and make sure the correct audio devices are selected. How about now? Oh, yes. Okay. So I'm going to remove my headphones because uh, for whatever reason, it doesn't seem to like my headphones today. So can you hear me? See my presentation? Yeah, I can hear you and we can see okay, your presentation. Okay, great. I hope it continues. Alrighty. So uh, again, my name is Sven Eric Spiesiger. I'm the managing entomologist with the Washington State Department of Agriculture Pest Program. Uh, part of my responsibilities are to oversee the insect survey section, the insect taxonomy section, and our eradication section which fits in really good with invasive species management because we're either going to be managing constant introductions of invasive species or just trying to eradicate them um, completely. Uh, under uh, my section, we, we run the Apple Maggot program, which is one where we're managing and uh, using regulatory to keep something in check and keep trade open. Uh, we, we do the gypsy moth survey and eradication program. Uh, we run the Japanese beetle uh, program, which also supports our nursery trades and our grape industry and other things like that. Uh, we run cooperative agricultural pest survey, and this in Washington usually means uh, wood destroying insect surveys. Uh, we just recently picked up Asian giant hornet as a program. Uh, we've been running exotic snail survey and an eradication project for about 15 years, and I'm going to talk about that more. Uh, we also run quite a few commodity pest surveys, and you may remember Clinton Campbell talking about how important monitoring is. Uh, well, these, these are actually not just key to detecting invasive species, but to demonstrating that we don't have them so that our agricultural commodities can continue to be traded freely. These are some of the most important surveys we do, and it's an absolute success when we find absolutely nothing at all. And so that's, that's one of the uh, real fun ones we get to do. And then, of course, we also do emergency, invasive, and at least in my section, insect pest response. Um, I was asked to focus on uh, vineyard snail and gypsy moth eradication and talk about the templates we've been using. And so, kind of funny because when I think of a template for eradication, I think there really is no template because insects don't care about my rules. Uh, they never have. And so, uh, to me, uh, the template has always been flexibility and the ability for us to adapt to what an insect is throwing at us. And so um, a, a lot of folks will tell you, and a lot of folks that I work with will tell you, incident command structure, or ICS, this is the way to go. 
Uh, but the reality is, at least in my career, I started my first ICS full-blown um, uh, usage uh, to uh, uh, respond to an invasive pest was actually the introduction of emerald ash borer into the state of Pennsylvania, where we did actually use full-blown ICS uh, to respond to um, you know, the uh, first detection of emerald ash borer in Pennsylvania. Uh, but the reality is, and I've been through this nine times either as a training exercise or for real, is ICS, from my opinion, tends to place the management structure in a uh, satisfying the management structure as the main goal. And what I mean by that is we end up doing things that we would really never do just because that's what the structure calls for. And this leads to all kinds of other problems as you're moving along. Uh, but to me, the biggest problem uh, with using ICS for an insect pest uh, introduction is this artificial time pressure that's introduced as an artifact of the command structure. Um, this claims to be a very flexible thing. It's scalable. You can move it around. But at the end of the day, when we do our training exercises, we put artificial time limits on things that really just aren't there for this type of uh, a scenario. So for something like firefighting, I think this works really great. And uh, you know, don't don't let me uh, let you walk away thinking that I'm completely soured on it, because there are some excellent tools in this that we use that are part of what I'm about to talk about. But um, some of the other issues is we tend to replace qualified responders with those who aren't qualified. Um, it's not that they're bad people, uh, but we've actually had um, you know a safety officer recommend everybody wearing full-blown respirators to spray paint trees, which is not really required, but a strict reading of a label by somebody who just wanted to get it right uh, led to uh, just all kinds of uh, difficulties uh, with a response we have for spotted lanternfly. It definitely increases cost. Um, I have been made to add uh, many things to a response because of ICS that uh, generally speaking, uh, we're already set up to handle them. We would never do these things. And uh, so I just wanted to kind of throw that out there. And uh, one of the biggest problems I've experienced with it as a manager over the years is that it really hasn't been a good fit for existing management structures. Even though some of the barriers are supposed to be lifted by having an ICS status uh, declared over your incident, if you will, um, unfortunately, at the end of the day, uh, I still have direct supers, supervisors and union covered employees uh, that have this relationship that still needs to be maintained. So at the end of the day, it kind of makes you end up doing extra HR work. And uh, to me, these are kind of the things that we would like to set aside when we're talking about uh, ICS and templates for eradication and pest response. That I think, um, you know, if we could just take the best of it and use that, which is what we've been doing here in Washington, at least before my arrival and has continued. And so I, I like our sprinkling of ICS into response rather than a full blown ICS response. So the template that I use actually, uh, very much like Clinton said, uh, prevention, early detection, rapid response. Uh, eventually, if you fail, you end up with a species management. But if you're starting with a really good foundation of integrated pest management, so the, the three letter acronym I like to use for a template for eradication is actually has the word management in it and not eradication, it's, it's IPM. That's what I would prefer to use. And he actually, uh, Clinton actually gave a, a wonderful definition. I, I loved hearing it. Um, but for me, when I break it down, if somebody says, hey, you have a brand new pest in the state of Washington, what am I gonna do? First of all, I'm gonna study the biology of the pest. And when I say study the biology of the pest, we go to great lengths. Um, my first stop, uh, other than the lab to mail the specimen off, is the library. You know, you go out of your way to learn everything you can to learn about the pest. And for heaven's sakes, I know we're Americans and we like to do it first. We like to do it best. But believe it or not, other countries have dealt with the problems that we're being challenged with now. And so we like to tear through, say, 10 years of Korean literature when you get something like Spotted Lantern Fly come and see, you know, they've been dealing this with this for 10 years. Perhaps they know something we don't. And so not being closed minded and certainly going out of your way to make uh, relationships with researchers and folks overseas who have been working with this their whole lives has really paid dividend, um, really paid some great dividends in some of the things that we've responded to recently. Uh, second thing is we need to identify tools, resources, and strategies. And you know that's, that's the most important part. 
can you eradicate a pest when you're thinking of a template from eradication? Has it ever been done before? Is it even possible? You need to get that out of the way before you really start down the road. Um, we don't ever want to say, no, it can't be done, but the reality is um, when it comes to insects versus humans, insects have won that battle 99% of the time. And you know it can be really discouraging to be uh, looking at a new introduction, thinking, hey, I got to it early, I can do something, uh, knowing that uh, the track record for humans and not just the state of Washington, you know, not just the United States, but all over the world really is not that high when we're trying to eradicate a pest. Then you need to establish your classic economic threshold or your goals. And this is where you can say, hey, uh, you know, eradication is possible on this one. That is going to be our goal. So that is actually a management goal. Um, and so for me, that's where you go. Now that you've made that decision, you have the resources and you know these things, you need to select the tools you want to use and implement them and select them in a, a way that will help you to achieve your goals. And after you've been going for a little bit, this is when the real uh, to meet a real gem of IPM starts is where you evaluate your results, you adjust, and you go back into battle, so to speak. And, you know, your goals may change in time, and so the adjustments may change as well, but uh, this is kind of our templates for eradication. And so I was asked to highlight uh, Mediterranean snail, also known as vineyard snail, or Cernuella vergata, and also uh, gypsy moth. And uh, those are the, the two we're going to focus on here. So first of all, uh, Serenoella vergata. So this started happening before I arrived in the state of Washington, and it was first detected in the Port of Tacoma in November of 2005 during the mop-up work for another eradication event. So uh, citrus longhorn beetle had been introduced in Tequila and uh, successfully eradicated, and we were doing um, apparently wood-boring beetle surveys, and one of our trappers, uh, happened to look down as she was servicing a trap in the port of Tacoma and noticed some snails. She picked them up and our excellent survey coordinator, Jenny Senna, um, had some suspicions immediately, sent it away and had it uh, basically identified as an actionable pest, Serenoella vergata, which um, is native to the Mediterranean states and is invasive in Australia and had been introduced in North Carolina before and eradicated. Uh, this is a pest of grains, primarily like wheat, and uh, that's pretty important. I'll go into why. And then it's also known to estivate or go into a dormant stage on vegetation above the ground and reaches such great numbers that it can clog farm equipment. Uh, upon harvest, can actually taint the crop to the point where it's unsaleable. And uh, Australia, unfortunately, has had some pretty severe troubles with this. You can see a photo of the snails built up um, and presumably estivating on a fence post here in a field, and this one's uh, from Australia. Um, and why this caught everybody's attention is because Washington actually ranks fourth among the nation's top wheat producing states. You know, you have an $800 million uh, value uh, commodity, uh, which is mostly exported actually. And so for us, wheat is hugely important. And so the ability for a snail to get over to the Eastern side of uh, Washington uh, from Tacoma is actually higher than you think. Um, unfortunately, uh, this is a, a hitchhiking pest that can attach to a, a truck tire. And when you're talking about a port, what do you see sitting around ports? You see tractor trailers, probably drove all night to pick something up, everything went wrong, so I have to sleep alongside the road. And unfortunately, these infestations were right up to the roadways, what, right where people park. Um, Snails can be a little difficult to identify, but in general, um, you know, this snail shell is variable in color. In Australia, they're mostly pale, but ours seem to mostly be pale with dark stripes. And then the umbilicus, so that's the area where the spiral comes together, is open. So you'll see a hole there rather than seeing it closed off. And in Washington, the species does not always estivate on vegetation above the ground. In fact, ours, at least in the, the plot that I've examined uh, that's left over, uh, seems to stay just a little underneath the vegetation. Uh, you can find them once in a while above ground, but all the ones that I've run into, especially during the time of year when they're dormant, are kind of down on the ground. In 2006, uh, we did the first thing. So we found a couple of snails. Uh, so we went out and did kind of an intensive survey and it was found that there was probably a 300 acre infestation on this one portion of the port of Tacoma. And, um, 
Uh, the tactics that were selected back then included vegetation management, so removal of the vegetation, uh, debris removal, snails like to hide under garbage, and apparently there was a lot of garbage around, restricting access to the area, so not letting tractor trailers or containers be stacked on the site or parked there, um, using a molluscicide bait, um, metaldehyde for the most part, uh, tried a few other things throughout the years, but that was the, the go-to, and uh, of course, education of the folks who own the port properties and the surrounding area. And all of this um, applied over time actually worked really well. Um, continued application of all of these tactics reduced that population to approximately one acre. And when we really drill it down into that acre, it's, it's not that yellow spot that you see in the middle there that's infested, it's just a couple little patches there. And uh, by the time I had arrived here in 2018, uh, this uh, project had basically remained stagnant. And so continually keeping up with vegetation management and baiting all around that site, um, all the other ones have been eradicated and several years of negative survey, uh, but we're left with this. So we have an issue that molluscicide cannot just be dumped into a wetland. And this little patch where it all first started, even though it had trees originally, looks different now, is actually designated as a wetland. And so where you see all those little yellow stars and little orange dots, uh, that's the last couple of years. And uh, it hasn't really changed in five years. And so obviously it was time to pull out the old IPM thing, reevaluate and switch situations. And uh, last year was horrifying because part of vegetation management means they load up a tractor with a brush hog, um, clear it out, and you can see we did a pretty intensive survey there last year uh, in preparation for what we uh, were going to attempt. And unfortunately, it seems like the tracker that's used to vote no vegetation managed to pick up a snail and locate it to a new plot, which we will, it is fortunately a paved plot, but we're gonna have to survey that now for three years of negatives to declare that eradicated. And so um, why get excited about one hitchhiking snail? Well, if you know about snails, it, it really does only just take one, being that they're hermaphroditic. So um, it is entirely possible to start a new population with just one snail. Um, so IPM comes on, we reevaluate, and my uh, former boss, Jim Mara, says, you know what? We've been steaming um, sudden oak death or Phytophthora romarum at a couple of nurseries. Let's try steaming the snails. Maybe they'll let us do that in the wet one. And you know what? Um, we decided, hey, yeah, let's go for it. We started talking with the port. We started talking with the city. Everybody seemed to like the idea. And so we were kind of getting ready to go. But then we found out, of course, as with everything else, there was some paperwork required. And uh, in 2019, we actually got held up by the Environmental Protection Agency, um, but not necessarily them. They wanted to ask a simple question from the Department of Justice. So it was the United States Department of Justice held on to a decision until it was probably too late to do anything in 2019. But we didn't wanna lose the whole year and we had eventually gotten permission to do this. It turns out adding hot water to an area that is intermittently wet does not constitute uh, much of an environmental risk, especially if we receive any plants that we may have killed. And so we were able to uh, get permission to do that. Um, we didn't want 2019 to be a total loss. So we did contract uh, Washington State University uh, to steam some plots where we couldn't use the pesticides. And so the plots needed to reach 56 degrees C for half an hour. And this was some, some literature um, where we did some testing in a warehouse, I guess, over in North Carolina on this species. And um, we really wanted to time our treatment for the period where the snails were estivating so that they weren't moving around. We could go from plot to plot, not worrying about ones moving from a plot that hasn't been treated to one that we already treated. Unfortunately, we missed that window, but we could also do a little bit of testing to see if it worked. And boy, uh, once we reduced the, the plot size, it sure was successful. We were getting 100% kill on plots that were roughly 25 by 35 feet. And um, you know, when you're talking about an acre, that's an achievable goal. And so in 2020, we received some PPA, so Plant Protection Act uh, funding, to go ahead and try doing 30 plots. And the plan was to start August 1st, because we know they're not moving around. We can quickly get in, get it done, and unfortunately, disruptions from COVID-19 delayed the start past the estivation period as some parts for the steamer didn't arrive in time. Just horrible luck. Um, but uh, 
why not go ahead and do it anyway? So we went ahead, uh, we had the money, we went and did the treatments. Uh, you can see there's a, you know, a pile full of snails that came out of one of the steam plots. They tend to apparently come up to the top before they die. And you can see there were plenty in there still, uh, but we killed quite a few. And uh, we're probably gonna have to do this again next year since we missed, uh, you know, the period where they estimate. But uh, the, it actually looks really good. We may be able to put this to bed. So this 15 year, eradication saga with just a little application of IPM and thinking outside the box a little. And so th this is why I kind of chuckled at uh, the, the, the title templates for eradication. The template is just to be flexible and to keep using IPM, keep going back and do the job until it's done. And so hopefully uh, we'll be able to uh, do this again in 2021 and then have three years of negative survey. We'll likely bring out the snail dogs again to confirm them in that third year, and we can consider this um, a long and uh, a tedious success, but a success. And so we're pretty pretty excited about that. Now, the second one I was asked to speak about is gypsy moth. And uh, gypsy moth, uh, whether you call it European gypsy moth, Asian gypsy moth, the new one we found last year, Hokkaido gypsy moth, it really doesn't matter. The threat to Washington is the same. They eat trees. Uh, the photo you see here is supposed damage from the new one, Lymantria umbrosa, uh, in Japan, uh, where they apparently like to eat larch trees. And, you know, um, when we're studying the biology of these, what's different? European uh, gypsy moth is established in the eastern portion of the U.S. The females rarely fly, and not so far if they do. So uh, we're subject to constant introduction by egg masses uh, laid on things like campers, RVs, moving pods, uh, freight and cargo, anything coming from the East Coast over to the West is an issue. And every year we find some European gypsy moths and when it gets bad enough, uh, we, we hit a trigger and we, we eradicate them. And for 40 years or so, we can still stand up and say, gypsy moth is not established in the state of Washington. And that's good for a lot of reasons. Asian gypsy moth uh, is coming to us uh, mostly through international trade. Uh, the females, uh, the species is larger as a whole and females fly up to 20 miles. Uh, the new one, Kaido gypsy moth is uh, a little bit paler. The females also fly up to 20 miles and it seems to prefer Japanese larch. And uh, it does something a little different. It prefers to lay its eggs on light or white bark birch uh, in its native range. And so it may need more specialized uh, uh, habitat uh, requirements here, but uh, all the same, um, it's a gypsy moth that defoliates uh, large trees and it's not something we want here in Washington. And so why do we get excited about gypsy moth? A lot of folks think that they only feed on oak and that's not entirely true. They will actually feed on conifers. And here in Washington, you cannot sustain the defoliation like this. This is completely unacceptable. Um, so we're not going to let it get to this. We do know if you let gypsy moth populations cook, eventually over time, it does lead to this. It has done it for decades here in the United States, and it has done it um, overseas as well. And so one of the things that uh, we just kind of put a line in the sand on is do not let a population get established and get out of control. And so that's kind of our threshold, if you will. This, this is our threshold. It's, it's as much environmental as it is economic. So when is it time to act? And, and that depends. Like I said, we do get catches every single year, um, but if we get multiple catches in the same trap or a group of traps located extremely close together, that's evidence that we had an egg mass hatch out, and uh, that's a good time to start treating. Repeated catches over consecutive seasons at the same location is probably good evidence that we also have a population cooking. And then any Asian gypsy moth or European gypsy moths that also display Asian genetics, like a hybrid moth with the A2 mitochondrial markers are ones that we would uh, treat for. And the reasoning behind this is, is that if, a, if the female is capable of flight, like it is with the Asian gypsy moths, um, then they can spread quite a bit further and create a, a much larger problem over a much larger area. And anybody who knows, if you're, doesn't really matter what you're treating, if you have to resort to doing the treatment, it's much better to do it over a small area uh, one time than get stuck treating, uh, treating something as a nuisance pest like they do in the East. In the East, when I was an entomologist, I would get angry calls from the citizens asking why we hadn't sprayed their neighborhood. 
here it's a little bit different. Nobody wants you to spray. Um, and you have to convince them it's probably a good thing to do or else other angry people won't make you spray every three years. So it's kind of one of those things where, where we play a nice balance, but uh, here most of the folks are receptive and they understand what's at stake. Um, Washington conducts, as Clinton pointed out, intensive detection survey every year. And uh, that's run by one of our uh, program managers, uh, Tiffany Paz, has just done an excellent job. And she's gone out of the way to run um, biological models, um, just paying attention to degree days. She's really optimized what we're able to do with our trapping dollars. And generally, she gets over 20,000 traps out. Uh, she did again this year. This has led to the detection of eight European gypsy moths. Um, in none of the areas where we got gyps European gypsy moth did we meet what we would consider to be a trigger for treatment. And unfortunately, the last detection of the year happened to be an Asian gypsy moth, and this was in Cowlitz County, kind of down near Mount St. Helens by Silver Lake. Um, the types of tools that are available, Clinton pointed out, they've used different stuff on gypsy moth for years. So we have, we have the luxury of having 100 years of trial and error backing us up when we uh, go ahead and make what our go-to uh, choice is. Um, we've seen people use lead arsenate. We've seen people being paid to go out and scrape egg masses. And, you know, at the end of the day, um, there's mechanical, which is the scraping of egg masses, mating disruption, parasitoid releases, and these really have not shown to be effective at, uh, you know, bringing a population into check. Um, WSDA actually prefers the aerial application of a biological, and pesticide, uh, of a biological pesticide, and that's Bacillus thuringiensis uh, variant Crustacea, or BTK. And why? Um, so the non-target impacts are limited to Lepidoptera that feed at the same time and the same place as gypsy moth larvae do. And so we do accept that there's going to be a loss of, uh, you know, some native Lepidoptera at the time we spray, but because we're spraying in very small blocks, uh, that particular habitat has the ability to be repopulated later on. And in fact, there are some studies that show if we don't spray a block, and these are studies out of Vancouver, British Columbia, that some of the native populations actually suffer due to competition from gypsy moth. Uh, so it's, it's actually better in the long run to wipe out a small infestation of gypsy moth and uh, trust that the area will be repopulated with the natives that were supposed to be there. Um, the treatments have a long history of working in just one season. Um, I, my predecessor told me he can only recall one time where we had to retreat, uh, but I would have to double check that, but that's what I remember him talking about. And of the biological options, uh, BTK is actually the, one of the safest, and it's actually what we use is labeled for use in organic food production. And uh, from what I remember from the label, you can actually use it up to the day of treatment. So if you're out buying organic vegetables, chances are uh, your products have had BTK used on them. And uh, the other nice thing is that it doesn't persist in the environment. It's not really nice for us because we're required to do three treatments uh, to make sure that we get everything uh, in any one plot. But uh, it is good because it's not like it's sticking around killing everything for the next 10 years. And so this is really why we prefer using DTK. Now, in 2021, obviously, I mentioned we got an Asian gypsy moth. Uh, this is right up against Silver Lake. We're proposing a spray block that's some 639 acres. Uh, there's actually quite a bit of managed forest land on the other side of the lake and just north of this. And so uh, not knowing exactly why this one is here, um, it's kind of a strange place to get an Asian gypsy moth. Um, it's best to be uh, extremely cautious and make sure we take care of any potential infestation that may be there. Um, this would be planned for the spring of 2021, and we're just in the uh, initial planning phases right now, but this is what uh, this is kind of what we're thinking as we move forward working with our uh, partners with the Forest Service and APHIS, and uh, of course the local community there. Um, what goes into a typical gypsy moth eradication? Well, there's a, a lot of environmental documentation, especially if you're going to go with an aerial application. And our, our excellent eradication coordinator, Ryan Wojohn, uh, generally takes care of all of this. And those efforts are underway right now. Um, we've done this a number of times, and it's kind of a well-oiled machine. So uh, he's able to get through this stuff pretty quickly. Um, we'll be contracting an applicator. And uh, that's another process that'll take place probably here in December or January. Uh, there's uh, 
quite a significant public outreach and communications effort that goes on here. And uh, this is really um, this is really key to a successful operation. Um, when you can uh, get your message out to folks, let them know you're not there to ruin their lives, and that in reality, that this is actually an environmental action because establishment of gypsy moth changes the game in a lot of ways. And so you wanna do whatever you can to make sure that that doesn't happen. And if you do it in smaller chunks like this, instead of spraying the entire state as you waited, uh, you're much better off in the long run. And when you have an excellent communications uh, team, it just makes your job easier. Um, we end up doing things like uh, town hall meetings, direct mailing to the folks who are you know, in the spray zone, and uh, we're always available to answer questions, and social media has been absolutely wonderful in helping us get good and accurate messaging out to those affected. Uh, you're then stuck with the, the hardest part, especially here in the Northwest, and that's prediction of hatch. Um, the East Coast has decades and decades of hatch data, but they're not us. And so uh, Tiffany Paws uh, actually uh, really has been uh, about, has gone above and beyond, uh, also with Ryan Wojohn, in running uh, predictive models for when these are going to hatch, because we want to time our spray for the second larval end stage, in in star, and that um, basically happens, uh, you know, some sometime around the second week of May is when we're going to usually end up spraying. However, um, micro habitats, depending upon uh, what the altitude is can change everything. Uh, in one instance, we had to sp split one of our spray box in half because half of it went up the side of a mountain and it was just 10, 15 degrees cooler there every day. And uh, the predicted hatch uh, turned out to be much later. And so we ended up having to do six flights in the area instead of just three. So uh, all these kinds of things go into it. Um, you're then going to uh, actually perform the application and that can be uh, a very uh, tedious time and you're generally leaving at dark. And so that means you're putting your people in place at three, four in the morning. Everybody starts to get a little cranky as we uh, start approaching June. Uh, but then, uh, you know, it seems like we get a little lull in our activities after that. But uh, the application uh, can be really fun. We did something new this year, a virtual command center and everybody really liked it. it turns out three in the morning with your own coffee in your own chair and in your bathrobe works out a, a lot better than three in the morning down in Olympia. So um, I think that's probably something we'll be looking at keeping moving forward. Uh, after a, an application is successful, you need to follow up with survey for three seasons. Um, the first season being the, the season of the application. So two more years after that. And uh, with three years of negative, you can declare uh, gypsy moth to be eradicated from an area. And this is really the template we've been following uh, probably uh, since the 80s or 90s here. I know there's some others who have been involved in this much longer than I am uh, in the audience and uh, certainly uh, can answer uh, questions maybe even better than I can when we get to the, uh, the end of this. And with that, um, our result is still no permanent established populations of gypsy moth in Washington. And uh, I'd like to thank everybody and hopefully I'm still on time or ahead of time. I can answer questions now or just wait till the, the panel at the end. Thank you so much, Ben. You are exactly on time. You guys are on Perfect. roll today. Thank you so much. And I'm glad we got your audio figured out. Um, yeah, if you wanted to hang out uh, until the panel, that would be great. I don't have any questions in the pane as of yet, but I'm sure they will. Perfect, so, thank you. Thanks.